Well, we are entering that time of the year where we're, we have so much going on in celebration and remembrance of our Savior's birth and Him coming to earth. One of those things is our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And so the video you just saw uh, promotes and reminds us of that offering, that offering that 100% of it goes outside of our church. So we take up several offerings throughout the year that all of that money goes outside of our church. And then some of you give individually you'll give just a individual gift at some time during the year to go to this ministry or that ministry or this church plant or that church plant all of that goes outside of our church I asked our office staff this last week to total up what has been given in 2021 to missions now this is in addition to the the money that we give through our budget so we give 10 percent of everything you give on a Sunday morning we give that we pass that along to the cooperative program but this is directed giving giving this is specific giving where we directly give this to missionary efforts both in North America and around the world and to this date in 2021 you have generously given over forty thousand dollars that goes outside of our church our goal for Lottie Moon this year is $20,000. So if we reach that goal, as I believe we will, and I believe we'll exceed that goal, that as we reach and exceed that goal, you will have given over $60,000 to North American and international missions in addition to above and beyond what we have given through our budget. So I want to thank you for your generosity. Go ahead and begin to pray now as a family. It's not really about the amount. It's about us doing this together, about us working together to do something. Not only, so, so this starts with your family. You coming together as a family and saying, what can we do for the Lottie Moon offering? Then it works with our faith family. Family, saying what can we do together first Baptist Tillman's corner and we set our goal at $20,000 but we're not the only church family doing this church families all across the United States are doing the very same thing we're doing and we want to come together to see the goal met of uh, funding missionaries all across the world to reach those who do not yet know the name of Jesus so thank you for your generosity thank you for praying about what your part in that will be. also want to remind you that you have in your seat, if you are with us in person, if you're visiting with us uh, online or you're joining us online, then we're going to get some electronic invitations to you or you can reach out to our church office and they'll get you some of these. But you have in your seat three invitations. Now, these are invitations that for our Christmas at the Corner, which is December 12th, Sunday morning. We need you to do two things with these invitations. First, we need you to take this, look at the information, and register. You can register here on campus. You can find one of our registration tables. It'll be set up now until December 12th. You can register online. The information's on here as to how you can do that. But we need you to register. That's, that's how we're going to know how much room we have left in each service, and that'll help us determine how many of these services we need to offer. We know we're going to have two services that day. We believe we'll need more, but that's where you've got to help us in knowing how many services we'll need that day. So when you register, that will help us know. By the way, we've got a fantastic setup for our kids. So we're going to have Christmas at the corner in here and Christmas at the corner in our kids' department. It's going to be a fantastic time. We need them to register as well so we can make sure that we have everything that we need for that. After you register, after you follow the information on this card that you're to use uh, to register, then you can use these cards to invite other people. Put this in their hands. Say, I'd love to have you come to Christmas at the corner. Use this as a reminder that this is a time of year when you can come and celebrate Christmas. Come as a family. There'll be something for your kids, something for you. It's going to be a fantastic day. Put this in their hand. If they say, hey, we want to come with you, then go back online, register them, let them, let us know that they're coming as well. You can all sit together. We're not assigning seats, but we just need to know who is coming that day. So you Use these to invite friends, families, neighbors to be with you here on December 12th and bring them uh, with you on the day. It's going to be a fantastic day. Well, we're going to turn our attention now to God's Word. In fact, we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation chapter 9 is going to be the most intense, in many ways the most terrifying passage of Scripture we have read to date in, in the book of Revelation. And as you're turning there, I want to tell you something that will set up our time together. It's a story that may be difficult for you to hear. It might even be difficult for you to believe, but I will tell it as best I can recall as it happened. I had a friend who had been struggling with a particular sin, the sin of pornography. 
And he had struggled with it for some time, and it was like many addictions where there would go, there would be weeks, maybe months at a time where he didn't give in to temptation, but then a time would come when he gave in to temptation. And on this particular time, he gave in to temptation. I believe it was a Wednesday or a Thursday night during the week, and he gave in to temptation. And as he was repenting from this and saying, Lord, I don't want to do this. I don't want this to be a part of my life. He prayed a prayer. He prayed a prayer that God would show him the true nature of the evil of his sin. Uh, two nights later, he went to bed, but he could not sleep. He was having trouble going to sleep, so he started pulling up some YouTube videos, some sermons to just um, maybe listen to while he was trying to go to sleep. But he started having these strange reactions, these emotional reactions to these sermons. He wanted to keep listening, listening to the sermons, but at the same time, he's having these difficult reactions. At some point in the night, he was overcome by darkness. In fact, he described it being like being inside of a tornado that was a tornado of darkness with some, some fire involved. But he said the most difficult part of it was that he could feel the weight of the heaviness of that. It was like a darkness that you could feel. He said it was like feeling evil itself. He said, well, maybe he just had a dream. Maybe he was listening to a sermon. Maybe as he drifted off to sleep, the pastor was preaching about something that made him think about that. And that might work well, except this is where I come into the story. I got a phone call from his family. His family said, early in the morning, pastor, you've got to come over here. It was a Sunday morning. So I got a phone call early around 4 or 5 a.m. You've, you've got to come over here. Something's wrong with him. And I thought at first it was medical. And I said, well, why are you calling me? We need to call 911. They said, no, this is not medical. This is spiritual. So I got in my car. I drove over to his family's apartment. And when I parked in the parking lot, my assumption is this is a medical, physical issue. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what's happening. And I'm going to get him in the car. We're, we're going to the ER. Or I'm going to call an ambulance. I'm, I'm going into this to uh, assuming that this is some kind of medical issue. But when I pulled in the parking spot at his apartment complex, I could hear him screaming. So I got out of the car, walked into the living room, and the family was all gathered in the living room, and they just kind of said, he's in there, <laughs> back in his bedroom. I knew where his bedroom was. I'd been to his, his apartment several times. And so as I walked back into his bedroom, he was on his hands and knees. This has been going on for several hours by this point. He was on his hands and knees. And when I walked into the room, he looked up at me and he said, no. He said, that man cannot come in this room. And I thought, well, maybe it's medical. <laughs> so I walked in. I started calling out his name. Saying, Are you okay? I'm, I'm really still assessing this from a, from a medical, physical standpoint, but I'm starting to be convinced that the family is right, that this is indeed a spiritual issue. And so uh, as I tried to talk to him, all he would say to me is, no, you cannot be in this room. And so I realized at this point we are dealing with something spiritual, not just spiritual, but something demonic. So I started to read scripture, and I started to read scripture and quote scripture about Jesus. And I went to Colossians chapter 1 and then Revelation chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 1. These are all passages that are about Jesus and who he is and his power and his majesty and authority. And I just started quoting these scriptures. And as I quoted these scriptures, he's, he's just screaming. And I'm just continually quoting these scriptures. And finally, I realized this is demonic. So at some point, listen, they don't have a class in exorcism uh, at seminary. They don't offer that class. And so they just kind of tell you to, to figure it out. And so at some point, I just said, um, you have no authority here. You have no power here. You leave this man alone. You have no power. Jesus has authority and power here. So eventually, this young man just kind of relaxed. He was probably in his mid-20s at the time, and he just kind of relaxed and uh, and, I, and I gave it a few seconds because, you know, I wanted to see what was, was happening here. And eventually I went over and got down on the floor with him and started talking to him. And he was back in his right mind. And so we sat up on the edge of the bed. And that's when he started to tell me the story that, that I just told you about him giving in to temptation and praying this prayer. And I told him two things. I said, well, uh, one thing's for certain. I believe God answered your prayer. And the second thing's for certain. That's a prayer I'm never going to pray. <laughs> I mean, Wow. What an incredible answer to a prayer. You say, Pastor, was he possessed? Was he oppressed? And I'll just have to say this. We know so little about how the supernatural world works. We should be careful about being too dogmatic about what happens. But I do believe this. 
I believe that there was a demonic power involved, and I believe that God did answer his prayer by showing him a small part, a small picture. Only by the grace of God did God not show him the true reality of sin. God showed him a small picture. See, because when you look at something like pornography or any other sin, it looks beautiful, it looks attractive, it looks appealing, but nothing could be further from the truth. It's actually utter evil, and it's ugly. But evil does not present itself as evil. Ugly does not present itself as ugly. All throughout Scripture, what we have are warnings that evil presents itself as light. Darkness presents itself as light. The Bible even tells us that Satan himself presents himself as an angel of light. Why? Because otherwise nobody would go along with him. If he came to you and showed you the reality of death and destruction, the reality of where sin leads, the reality of what the spiritual reality of sin really looks like, then no one would follow him. And his, uh, his hope is that you will follow him to your own death and destruction so that he himself is not alone in his condemnation and his death and his destruction. That is his goal. What the book of Revelation does is it reveals, it unveils, it pulls back the curtain. And it shows us that what we see, the kingdoms of earth, the things that we see on earth that are so beautiful and attractive, it pulls back the curtain and it helps us to see the true reality, the true ugliness of evil and of sin. And it also pulls back the curtain to show us the true power, the true authority of the kingdom of God. Revelation chapter 9 is one of those moments where the curtain is pulled back for us and we get to see the reality of the ugliness of sin and evil. As we see God continue to judge the sin of mankind, we have warnings that are given to us. We have this kind of revelation, if you will. And see, my friend, he, it was revealed to him what sin looked like, and he repented. But not everyone who sees evil, who understands evil, who gets a picture of evil, repents. In fact, I want to say it this way. Despite the clearest warnings and most severe judgments, some people refuse to repent of their sin. Revelation chapter 9 records the fifth and sixth trumpets, which are also the first of three woes. Trumpets are warnings. They sound an alarm. The enemy is coming. Prepare for battle. A woe, we're not as familiar with a woe. A woe is a statement of judgment a statement that certain destruction is coming from God because of sin. There are many places in Scripture that we could go to understand what this idea of woe means, but there's none better than Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah sees the Lord in the temple, and the train of his robe fills the temple, and he sees many of the same things that we've seen in the book of Revelation. Isaiah gets a small glimpse of what is seen here. But Isaiah's response is so amazing. Because as Isaiah sees all of this, he's not filled with worship. He's filled with despair. And here's what he says. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 5. Woe is me for I am lost. That's the ESV. The King James Version says, woe is me for I am undone. The NIV may be my favorite translation of that verse. Woe is me for I am ruined. Why? Why? Because I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the Holy One. I have seen the Lord and my sin is so obvious to me and I am undone, ruined, lost. The Hebrew word is cut off. I am done for. Woe. It's a statement of woe. So what we have in Revelation chapter 9 are two trumpets, the fifth and sixth trumpet that are both warnings and the first and second woes, they overlap one another. So they're statements of judgment. And they are difficult to read. They're even more difficult to wrap our minds around the seriousness of the evil of sin. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 9 verse 1, The fifth angel blew his trumpet, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened with the smoke from its shaft. Then from the smoke came locusts on earth, and they were given great power like the power of scorpions on the earth. 
They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any green plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads. They were allowed to torment them for five months, but not to kill them. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings someone. And in those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. In appearance, the locusts were like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were what looked like crowns of gold, and their faces were like human faces. Their hair like women's hair, their teeth like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the noise of their wings was like the noise of many chariots with horses rushing into battle. They have tails and stings like scorpions. And their power to hurt people for five months is in their tails. They have as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon and in Greek he is called Apollyon. The first woe is past. Behold, two woes are still to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who were bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard their number. And this is how I saw the horses in my vision and those who rode them. They wore breastplates, the color of fire and of sapphire and of sulfur. And the heads of the horses were like lion's heads, and fire and smoke and sulfur came out of their mouths. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and smoke and sulfur coming out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents with heads, and by means of them they wound. The rest of the mankind who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons and idols of gold and silver and bronze and stone and wood, which cannot see or hear or walk. Nor did they repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immoralities or their thefts. Despite the clearest warnings and the most severe judgments, some people refuse to repent of their sin. The warning in this passage is given to us in two trumpets, which are also two woes. The first trumpet and the first woe is this, demonic locusts. Now, as we go through this, you have no doubt this question. Are we talking about literal locusts? Are we talking about some kind of creature that's going to walk across the face of the earth, fly across the face of the earth? Or or is this symbolic? Is this one of those times where we are to interpret the things of Revelation symbolically? Well, it's difficult to know at which points in Revelation we're to use symbolic interpretation and which points we're to use literal interpretation. On the back of your worship guide, I've given you pretty much the gamut of interpretation from extremely literal to extremely symbolic. Here's what I want to say about both of those, and I've given you a middle position. Here's what I want to say about both of those extremes. It would not be unlike God to use prophetic statements such as these and these visions and these visual images to simply be symbolic. In fact, there are many times in the Hebrew Scriptures when he does just that. He uses such symbolic statements to represent the severity of judgment. And when you read that, don't take comfort in that. And you say, well, maybe it's not going to be so bad because maybe this is all symbolic. We should actually understand it to be exactly the opposite. There is nothing on this earth that is so terrifying as the wrath of God against sin that God has to use symbols that really are are unearthly, that are unnatural, that are out of our realm of expectation and experience. That's what God has to use to somehow approach what it will be like when God unleashes his wrath against sin. So don't take comfort in the idea that it might be symbolic. But also, don't write off the thought that this might be literal. If you are one who interprets it symbolically, don't say of those who interpret it literally, well, I mean, how ignorant can you be? Certainly, they're not going to be real horse-headed, scorpion-tailed, snake-tailed kind of beings. Is it not our Father and Creator who created the horse, who created the scorpion, who created the snake... Is it not he who created the lion? Is it beyond God's creative ability to create creatures such as are described in Revelation chapter 9 and unleash them on the earth? No, it is something that God can do without even a thought. So certainly God could create and release such beings upon this earth. Whether it is literal or symbolic or somewhere in between as is given to you on the back of your worship guide, one thing is for certain. It's terrifying, and it is meant to be terrifying. 
It is meant to show us the reality of the wrath of God that is coming against sin. What I want to do in these, these two trumpets and two woes is I want to focus on what we do know. First is this, we know that the fifth trumpet judgment is demonic. The Bible says a star fell from heaven. Most often in Scripture when a star falls from heaven, it does represent a fallen angel. It doesn't necessarily have to, but most often it does. We don't know if this fallen angel might be Satan himself or it might be some other demon, but we have an indication here that this is demonic activity. And that, and that indication is clarified for us when we read about the abyss or what some translations, including the ESV, say is the bottomless pit. This is a place that is in Scripture and even spoken of outside of Scripture as a place where God locks away demons for a particular time. So the star falls from heaven, has the key to the abyss, opens the abyss, and releases this demonic power. We also know this is reminiscent of God's past judgments. God has judged in similar ways in the past. In the book of Exodus, we have the record of the eighth plague of Egypt. If you'll remember, that eighth plague was a plague of locusts that darkened the whole land. It's a little different here. They, in Revelation chapter 9, they darken the whole land by blotting out the sun. In other words, there are so many of them that the sun doesn't shine through for some period of time. But in the book of Exodus, it was that they darkened the whole land because there were so many locusts that the land turned to be the color of those dark locusts. But we still have seen before a plague of locusts that darkens the entire land. Most uh, reminiscent is this judgment of the book of Joel. The book of Joel records God's judgment against Israel, which includes a plague of locusts with teeth like that of a lion. We find out in the book of Joel that this this plague of locusts is actually representative of an army. He describes in later chapters an army that's actually coming to Israel. And he says this army is going to be like that plague of locusts. But it's going to be like a plague of locusts that instead of having the teeth of a locust, they're going to have the teeth of a lion. In other words, they're going to devour and destroy everything they touch. And what one group is, takes, another group, uh, what one group leaves, another group is going to come and take. And the land is going to be left desolate. That's in the book of Joel. Well, I want you to see what happens here in Revelation chapter 9 is God says, what happened when I judged my people, the nation of Israel, when I judged them for their sin, what happened there was like in some ways just a really small version of what will happen when I remove my hand and the wrath of God against sin finally comes on mankind. See, God has been storing up his wrath, the Bible says, against sin, and he holds it back with his grace and his mercy. But a day is coming where God will remove his hand of grace and mercy and the wrath of God will be unleashed against the sin of mankind. So we see a little dose of it in a book like the book of Joel. And the people of God who were under God's judgment because they weren't really his people, they had rejected him and denied him, they tasted a little bit of God's judgment in a plague of of uh, in a, an army that was like a plague of locusts with the teeth of lion. But we see, we see here that these locusts having the teeth of a lion is just the start of the description. They have tails that are like a scorpion's tail and they sting. And, and, and on and on the description goes. They have hair like a woman's hair. They have something like a gold crown on their head. So yes, this is something like what Joel described. This is above and beyond. Why? Because this is that time where God doesn't release a small dose of his wrath against sin, God finally removes his hand and the full wrath of God is released against sin. It is difficult to imagine or put into words what that day will be like. The closest we have is something like Revelation chapter 9 in its descriptions. We also recognize that this plague is directed at humanity and not the rest of creation. We've seen up to this point that the judgments have been against portions of creation, against the sea or against the, the fresh water or against the land. And in, in doing that, it's kind of a, a second-hand judgment against us. It harms us in some way. But in this moment, it's exactly the opposite. The vegetation is left. That's what you would expect from locusts, that the locusts would devour the vegetation. But at this moment, the vegetation is left, and these locusts, are focused simply on tormenting humanity. It is directed at humanity, specifically those who are not sealed by God. Know this, that from Old Testament to New, from the first day until the last, God knows how to protect and seal those who are his. 
God knows how to save us out of it. God knows how to pull us through it. And it is limited to those who are not sealed by God. This is something God does often. We're reminded uh, most immediately of the Passover. As God said to his people, judgment is coming to the nation of Israel. But if you will put the blood on the doorpost, everyone in that house, when judgment comes, I will pass over them. Well, in the same way as this judgment comes to earth, those who are sealed on their foreheads with the seal of God all the way back, going all the way back to Revelation chapter 6, those who are, uh, chapter 6 and 7, those who are sealed will not face this judgment. It will, if you will, pass over them. So this is directed at humanity, specifically at those who have not placed their faith in Christ. And this is a judgment of pain and torture, but without death. Although we're not sure how that would work out. It might be some kind of debilitating disease which paralyzes you but does not kill you, causes you intense pain but does not take your life. I know there are those in this room who have walked through both physical, mental, and emotional suffering that you have wished would end in death, but it did not. That was perhaps for a short time, but in this moment, this will be a plague and a torture that continues on and on, yet death will not come. It's also swift and intense. Notice that as we walk through the book of Revelation, the intensity of these judgments and the speed with which they come has increased all along, and none is more swift and none is more intense than what we have read here in Revelation chapter 9 with both the fifth and sixth trumpet. And then it is filled with destruction. The Hebrew word uh, Abaddon and the Greek word Apollyon, that is the name of this leader of this army of locusts, demonic locust, both in Hebrew and Greek, simply means destruction or the destroyer. This is intended to utterly and totally destroy. We're also reminded at the very end of this trumpet, verse 12, the first woe has passed. Behold, two woes are still to come. That's not a statement intended to encourage us. It's a statement to remind us we're in one out of three. One has come yet to remain. Why would we read something like this? Because God's desire is to warn us. It's to warn us through trumpets and woes. The first of which we've read about today is the fifth trumpet. And the first woe, it's a demonic plague of locusts. The sixth trumpet and the second woe is this, a demonic army. The sixth angel blows his trumpet. And a voice from heaven reminding us that this is all under the control of God. Though it is demonic in nature, though it is difficult for us to read, though it is unbelievably terrifying, this is all, in fact, under the control of God. This is God's measured wrath being poured out on sin. And this voice calls out from the altar that is before God. And the sixth trumpet is blown and the second woe comes to be. And we're told that it too is demonic. There are four angels, four angels that are released from the river Euphrates that are prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, set aside for specifically this time to lead what is described as some kind of demonic army. This demonic army is different from that army of locusts because it is lethal. Instead of torturing without killing, this one kills a third of mankind. But it too is reminiscent of God's past judgments. It reminds us Again, of the book of Joel. The book of Joel records a plague of locusts, and then one chapter later it describes that plague of locusts as an army, as an army that seems like that men are united to horses. They're so fast, they're so furious, they're so intense. This was something that terrified those people who lived in the Mediterranean world, those people who lived in what is geographically known as the Roman Empire, but even before it was the Roman Empire, when it was the Babylonian Empire, when it was the Assyrian Empire, when it was the Greek Empire, all the way up to the time it was the Roman Empire. They feared the people of the East. Why? Because the people of the East uh, were, were difficult to deal with in battle because they rode on horses and their archers were mounted archers. And they were very efficient in battle. And from the time they were young, they were put up, placed on horses and they were taught to shoot from horses. So they were very difficult to defeat in battle. It was first the Babylonian Empire, then the Assyrian Empire, then the Greek Empire, then the Roman Empire itself that learned the hard way that you cannot invade the East. In fact, modern-day Iraq is about as far as any of those empires ever expanded because these people were so difficult to defeat in battle. 
So this evokes these terrifying images of the people from the east who seem like they're united, one with their horse, and here comes an entire army of them. The number is twice times 10,000 times 10,000, which is worked out for us in some of our translations as 200 million. But the point here is not to put a number to it. The point here is to be overwhelmed at the vast number of this army. This army is intended to indicate the the wrath of God against sin in all of its greatness. Again, whether it is literal or symbolic, it communicates the same thing. God's wrath is coming against sin. The use of fire, sulfur, and smoke. Sulfur being another word for brimstone. You know, we hear about fire and brimstone preaching. That's because the Bible talks about God's judgment in terms of fire and brimstone. And we're reminded most immediately of the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah in which God used fire and smoke and brimstone to judge the cities of God at Sodom and Gomorrah. So once again, God has reached into judgment past and said, if you think that was a difficult judgment, if you could look at that and see that as a microcosm, as a miniature uh, experience of what the wrath of God when it is poured out against sin will be like, then you can have, begin to have some kind of understanding of what that day will be like. It's also terrifying. Not only does it evoke these images that were terrifying to those in the first century, but it evokes images that are quite terrifying to us. Specifically, that image of a horse with a snake as its tail. It just strikes at some of our most primal fears. This is indeed a terrifying picture of judgment. And it is but the second of three woes. The first two woes have passed. The fifth and sixth trumpets have blown. And now, God gives us a picture, a glimpse of the response of humanity. How would humanity respond if it sees, if it sees the ugliness of sin, if it sees the real death and destruction that sin brings. And here's where I want to take a moment to remind you of this. What we see in Revelation chapter 9 is not an overreaction by God against sin. It is the proper reaction from God against sin. Only we live in a time of God's mercy and in grace where his hand holds back his wrath of, uh, against sin. And so we come to say, well, God must not have any real wrath against sin. But it is not true. No, the wrath that God holds back today is his right and just and true reaction against sin, but it is only by his grace and mercy that he holds it back. What we read in Revelation chapter 9 is not an overreaction. What we read in Revelation chapter 9 is a proper reaction. So how then will humanity respond to this judgment of God against sin. When they finally see the real death, the real destruction, the real difficulty of sin, how will they respond? Well, the Bible responds, res, re, uh, the Bible recalls or describes their response in this way. It is nothing less than unrepentant sin. Verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. How does the Bible describe the works of their hands? The Bible says they did not repent of worshiping demons. You're going to read this list and say, well, most of these don't apply to me. Worshiping demons, idol worship, murders, sorceries. These things don't really apply to me, but, but not so fast. They did not repent of worshiping demons. You say, well, I, one thing's for sure, I don't worship demons. And here's what the Bible tells us, specifically 1 Corinthians chapter 10. That anything we worship other than God is actually demonic worship. It's a, it's a trap set up for our hearts to be drawn away to something other than God, to look to something other than God for our worship. It's the very same with idol worship. The Bible says that behind every idol is a demon. So when we worship an idol, we're really worshiping a demon. What does it look like to worship an idol or to worship a demon? It looks like this, looking to something other than God for something that only God can give. Maybe it's protection, provision, fulfillment, joy, but any time we put something other than God in the place and ask it to do what only God can do, then we are worshiping demons, we are worshiping idols, we are worshiping, if you say, well, I'm still not convinced I'm worshiping demons. You are worshiping the demonic system of the world that is set up to steal from God the worship that is only due to him. Therefore, it's demonic worship. So this worship of demons, well, how will I know, pastor? How will I know? Let me ask you this. Who or what tells you how to spend your time? Who or what sets your priorities for the day? Who or what gets you out of bed early? Who or what causes you 
to invest your time, your talents, and your treasures? Who will you neglect your family for? What will you neglect your family for? Who will cause you to put those things that should be first in second or third or fourth or fifth place? When you have the answer to that question, then you know indeed what it is that you worship. Those things are things that ought only to be reserved for God. God deserves to be our highest priority. He is the only one who comes before our families and those that God has called us to care for. God is the only one who can bring us fulfillment. God is the only one who can bring us joy. God is the only one who can provide. God is the only one who in our moments of desperation we can turn to. Who do you turn to in a moment of desperation? It's been a difficult day. You get bad news. Where do you turn? Where do you turn to pull you away from that bad news, that bad day? What do you turn to? That will tell you what it is that you worship because you believe it's that thing that can somehow solve that problem when in fact it is only the Lord himself. Then there are murders. Well, certainly, Pastor, I've never committed a murder. There might be someone here or maybe even somebody watching who actually has committed a murder. And I would say to you, God is perfectly capable of forgiving murder just like he is of any other sin. But don't write off the fact that you're not a murderer. Remember the words of Jesus. Jesus says there's a way you can murder with your heart. There's a way without ever lifting your hand against someone you can murder with your heart. It comes in some form of wishing somebody didn't exist. Wishing that someone wasn't somebody that you had to deal with, that they just weren't there. It comes in the form of wishing groups of people didn't exist or types of people didn't exist. Be careful. Be careful when you see images or videos or news stories. Recognize that those stories are written and those pictures are chosen. The headlines are chosen to enrage you. In fact, to do exactly what Jesus said we ought not to do, to look at a group of people or a type of person or even a person specifically and say, I wish that person didn't exist, or to say there's no way that person could have access to the grace of God. Jesus said to do that is to murder them in your heart. Then there are sorceries. Ah, I've watched enough movies. Pastor, I know I am no sorcerer. <laughs> the word sorcerer is the, word, the Greek word pharmacia. You don't have to be a scholar to recognize. That's where we get our word pharmacy from. What does a sorcerer do? A sorcerer goes out, collects natural elements, learns how to mix those natural elements to put people under a spell or to give them a potion. In other words, a sorcerer is what we might call a first century drug dealer. Someone who says, hey, I'm going to give you something again that, that takes you away, that pulls you away from the reality of the world, that makes you feel different, that pulls you away so when you understand what a sorcerer really is and understand what sorcery really is, you realize that in 2021, we are eat up with sorcery, if you will. We're surrounded by it. It's all around us. And it's the abuse of legal prescribed drugs, and it's the use of illegal drugs. Again, just to somehow draw you away, to make you forget, to somehow replace something that only God can provide for you to look for it in some other place. Sexual immorality, it is obvious that we live in maybe the most sexually immoral time and culture in a thousand years or more. However, we must be very, very careful to not sit inside of the church and see all of the sexual immorality that is outside of the church or to be inside of our family and see all the sexual morality that is outside of our family or, or just to be personally look outside of ourselves and say, well, at least I'm not like those people. The sexual immorality we need to be most concerned about is our own sexual immorality. The sexual immorality the church needs to be most concerned about, not to say that we're not concerned about the sexual immorality outside of the church, but the sexual immorality we ought to be most concerned about is that that is within the church. You know, it's very easy for a Southern Baptist pastor to preach a sermon on homosexual sin. It gets a lot of amens, it gets a lot of pats on the backs, it gets a lot of shares on Facebook, it gets a lot of, hey, we need to hear more of that. And our church is very clear where we stand on those issues when it comes to God's view of sex and marriage. But the problem is, in Southern Baptist churches, 95 to 99% of the sexual sin in Southern Baptist churches is not homosexual sin, it is heterosexual sin. There's plenty of it. And so when we only preach against homosexual sin or the LGBTQ worldview, when we only preach against that, we ignore the plank that is in our eye and we point out the speck that is in our brother's eye, 
Pastor, it is no speck. Obviously, you misunderstand Jesus' parable. Jesus' parable is to, is to teach us this. The plank is always in our eye. The speck is what's in someone else's eye. The size of the sin does not determine it. It's whether it's our sin or someone else's. We are always to assume that our sin is the plank and someone else's is the speck. Why? Because our hearts will point us to someone else's sin. So sexual immorality. And then thefts. You know, some people steal things by going into a store and stuffing it in their pocket and walking out the front door. But other people steal things by cheating on their taxes. Other people steal things by cheating their work. Other people steal things by checking in on their time card and and not really being there or by fudging the numbers just a little bit. And you say, well, as hard as I work for them, as hard as I work for them, tell that to the Lord when you stand before him. Other people steal by taking advantage of those who are less intelligent than them or have less resources than them and they know that they can exploit them and get more money out of them and take from them what is rightfully theirs. There is all kind of theft that happens at the very small level and the very highest levels and God says this about it, the rest of mankind did not repent of the works of their hands despite the clearest warnings In the most difficult judgments, some people refuse to repent of their sin. How could it be possible that humans could endure what we've just read, what we've just struggled to understand, what we've just struggled to wrap our minds around? Even the the incredibly crisp imagery fails us in grasping what it will look like when God removes his hand and the wrath of God in a measured way is poured out against sin. How is it possible that humans could endure such wrath and yet not repent? I'll remind you of Pharaoh and his facing God's plagues and his refusal to repentance. If you look in your worship guide, it's laid out for us chronologically. In Exodus chapter 8, the Bible says that, that he was pricked. He recognized that he was rebelling against God And at some points along the way, many points along the way, he decides that the right thing to do is to let God's people go, is to do what God has said. He decides he has come up against an opponent that he cannot outmatch. But, Exodus chapter 8, the Bible says, Pharaoh hardened his heart. In other words, his heart was soft. He was considering letting them go, considering repenting, considering being obedient and submitting himself to the God of all the universe. But there came a point where he said, no, I will not. And he hardened, he stiffened his heart against God. The Bible says again in Exodus chapter 8 verse 32, Pharaoh hardened his heart. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 9 verse 7, the Pharaoh, the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Exodus chapter 9 verse 34, Pharaoh yet again hardened his heart. Finally in Exodus chapter 10 verse 20, the Bible says the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. How can it be that despite the most intense warnings and judgments, people will not repent? It might be because they choose to stiffen their heart against God, but here me clearly there comes a time where God says I will only allow you to refuse my grace and forgiveness so many times and the Lord will harden and stiffen your heart pastor I don't like that you said that I didn't say it God said it so what are we to do with that we're to do this if the Lord pricks your heart and the, your heart is soft against repentance, uh, uh, towards repentance. And today the door is open for you. Whether you're hearing this in person or you're watching online, the door is open for you to repent. Then today is the day of repentance. Do not say, I'll wait. They'll come another time. There might not come another time. The Bible says that Esau sought repentance in tears and could not find it. There comes a time when God says, The offer of grace is closed to you. There comes a time when God says, in fact, the offer of grace is closed to all that dwell on the earth and I will remove my hand of grace and mercy and the wrath of God will be poured out against sin. How is it possible that we could hear such a warning from God without repenting? You might be here today and you might say, see, this is why I'm not a Christian. All this wrath and judgment stuff 
You guys talk so much about grace and mercy. I don't hear any grace and mercy in this passage. We've intentionally sung about grace and mercy all morning long. We're going to continue to sing about grace and mercy. Why? Because everything we just read about, everything we just just did our best to, to grasp and describe, here's what happened at Calvary. God himself became a man and stood between us and his own wrath and he removed his hand and he rightly and justly judged our sin. And everything that we've read about in Revelation chapter 9 and add on Revelation chapter 8 and 7 and 6 and add on what we've not yet read in the book of Revelation, all of that judgment, all that wrath against sin, that's what was poured out on Jesus at the cross as God's wrath of what wrath was poured out against him. That's why we sing that on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. And here in the death of Christ, I live. It's the gospel. What was rightly earned by our sin was given to our Savior so that was what was rightly earned by our Savior could be given to us. That is the great exchange of the gospel. It's why we sing that his mercy is more. It's why we sing about his overwhelming and amazing grace that God has given us this opportunity. And my question to you is this. How could it be possible that we would hear about such grace? And how could it be possible that we would hear such a warning about the wrath of God that is coming against sin without repenting? Today is your opportunity. You have that moment to repent. You have heard the warning. In fact, you're privileged above those that we read about in Revelation chapter 9. You're privileged in that you have heard the warning and not lived through the woe. The warning has come to you. And the woe is not yet here. And you have opportunity to repent. Today is that day. The altar is open. The heart of God is open. The hand of God is extended Will you hear? Will you repent? That is my prayer today. Father, would you move upon the hearts of men and women, boys and girls, to bring them to repentance, to bring them to faith? God, would you do that? Lord, only you, only you can soften a heart to repentance. And I pray that as those hearts are softened, as you move on hearts and in lives today, God, that we would not stiffen our heart to you but we would give in to you, that we would submit to you, the God of all the earth. And I pray this in Jesus' name.